Hey everybody, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Reza Aslan is a religious scholar, author, and host of the new interview series, Rough Draft, where he interviews creatives about the process behind some of their greatest works. Let's take a look at a clip from Rough Draft. You guys have 23 protagonists. So we're uh, like it, it, six times as good as Faulkner. Like, I, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Six Faulkners. You are six Faulkners. <laughs> that's what you of are. the alcohol it would take <laughs> to power. But I mean this, like, I mean, honestly, you are talking about 23 fully realized three-act narrative <laughs> arcs, you know, yeah. for each of these right. characters, I which is insane. I don't know if they're all fully realized. All right, well, there's maybe a few of them are fully the little little less realized than uh, yes. they're fully. <laughs> How do you juggle that? I mean, first of all, it's such a violation of every rule of writing, yeah. but how do you juggle it all? Well, it's a very special situation. In the first movie, we had 18 movies behind us, yep. and in the second movie, we had 21 movies behind us. Right. So I'm not saying it made the job easier, if anything, it made the job harder, but it, it did allow us to be leaner in terms of character setup, because mm. everybody knew who they were and their basic dynamics so that we could get into plot and get these people into situations as fast as possible. We also um, ranked them, right? There's uh, uh, Groot and Mantis do not have the... Uh, the Groot arc. doesn't get three acts. No, but um, he gets a beginning, <laughs> middle, and end. He goes from sullen teenager to a guy who contributes by cutting his right. arm off and picking up a hammer. Yeah. Oh my God. But Thor, say, goes through a much uh, bigger journey. But yeah, when attacking that, we had something like 23 characters that would, uh, come, that, that would appear on the poster one day uh, and said, oh my God, we can't do it if we do it uh, a traditional way, all right? Or the traditional way we have to do it is to just flip it. So that Thanos is gonna be the guy that's driving and everything, and in in the structure of the movie, the Avengers are the antagonists. Yeah. Right. Right. Everybody, please welcome Reza Aslan. Let's hear it. Thank you. Sir, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, thanks for having me. Congrats on the show. There is, uh, obviously, I, I do this for a living, so there's nothing that I love more than talking about craft and process and the process behind some of our greatest craftsmen and greatest uh, creatives, because usually everybody has their own process, but also that process usually is do it every day. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, writing is such a mysterious uh, process for a lot of people, you know? I mean, I think that there are... A lot of writers that I know who sort of feel like, oh, like the spirit has to move them, you know, before they can write. Like they have to wait for the muses to call them, uh, that it's some kind of, you know, spiritual experience that they have to write, uh, they have to go through before they can actually produce any material. I would call those people liars. I would call them uh, unemployed. That's what I would call them. Uh, yeah. Even the ones who are employed, I'm sorry, don't mean to interrupt you, I care very deeply about Writers this. Writers write. Is that like, even if you need the spirit to move you, when the spirit moves you and you have that idea, you have to start writing that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And you're only yeah. gonna write trash to find good parts of that idea and better ideas. So it's not like the muse moves you and whatever comes out is great. You still have to go through the same yep. sort of digging that every other writer has this to go through. This is what I always tell my students is that if you don't treat writing like a job, it'll never be your job. Yep. You know, it's like nobody, no, the, the guy who works at McDonald's doesn't wake up and say, you know what, the, the spirit uh, hasn't moved me today, so I'm not gonna do the fries. You know what I mean? Like, that's not how it works. You, you, it's your job. You punch in, you work. And the same thing is true of, of writing. And all, all of the most successful writers, certainly the ones that I've interviewed, but all the writers that I know um, say the exact same thing, that you just wake up, you sit in front of your computer, you punch the clock, you write, uh, and then, you know, then your day is over. Like that, you've got to treat it that way. And writing can mean a number of different things as well while you're sitting in front of that computer or when you punch the yeah. clock, right? It can mean researching. It can mean It reading. mostly means like Facebook, Twitter, and, and, right. and surfing porn. It That's a lot of it is being that. Yeah. slightly open to the possibility of writing <laughs> <laughs> and writing or not. We do this thing at the end of every one of our episodes that we that we sort of reserve for socials uh, called the five questions. And one of those questions to every guest that we have is what's your writing process? Um, and everyone's got their own thing. You know, some people are like, well, I, I do it at four in the morning or I, do, you know, I only write on Tuesdays or whatever the case may be. But yeah, for everyone, there's always that that issue of, 
Um, and then I check my email yep. uh, for 25 minutes. And then I see what's on Facebook for a while. And, you know, we writers... And I we, chastise myself we'll for doing do, that. Yes. And then we'll do any reason not to write. We'll take it. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're sitting down, if your butt is in that chair, if you, your hands are on the keyboard then it's, it's hours that you're actually working. So it's, it's just all about maintaining that momentum. Write, 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 write. Writers write, it's as simple as that. What is your process? Because you are a writer as well. Yeah, yeah. For me, um, because I do so many other things, my writing always comes in seasons. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I always feel like I'll look at sort of, you know, 2020 and I'll think to myself, okay, so it looks like, you know, Th these few months, those are my writing time. And then during those months, I write every day. I mean, I, I sit down. It's, a, it's very much a, uh, a nine to five kind of experience for me, you know. Um, do you have a limit to how much you can write in a day? Like, do you, do you get worn out? Do you get tired? Do you have, like, two solid hours where you can actually, like, sit and write? Or is it yeah. nine to five of just sort of figuring, <laughs> yeah. like, trying to No, I'm, I'm, there, I'm there for the full, like, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours. Uh, but yeah, I would say maybe two of those hours are actually right. productive and creative. I'm also the I'm also not the kind of writer that just wants to kind of get everything out and then fix it later. I obsess over my sentences. I will sit there and just work on just the punctuation of a sentence for about 45 minutes. I'll I'll leave. You know, I'll be in the shower just kind of reworking the sentence again and again in my mind. Uh, when I say like I write for six hours, I'd say three of those hours is just rewriting what I wrote yesterday anyway. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I don't understand the idea of being able to sort of sit down and just pick up where you left off. I feel like that to, drive me nuts. I need to stream back into it in some yeah. way, and that usually requires about an hour or two of <laughs> just being merciless with myself about what I wrote the day before. But, I mean, when you think about it, uh, you know, I always say writing is not rocket science. It's way harder than rocket science. Way harder. You know, rocket science, all right, congratulations. You memorized some algorithms and some math, and then you regurgitated them. Congrats. Writing is about using words to manipulate other people's emotions as though you are God. That is very difficult to do. And so the really good writers, the really great writers, um, for them, the, the writing process is mechanical. It is about just, you know, your butt in a chair. But the actual creation of the work uh, that is where the magic comes from. That, it, that they, they describe it very much as a mystical experience. You know, sometimes the best work is the work where when you're finished, you realize, wait, who did I, who wrote that? Right. Did I write that? Like, I look at some of my best, the, the stuff that I'm proudest of, I read, and I have no memory of ever having written it. Of course. But then the stuff that you remember having written, you're that's like... That's the shit. Yeah, yeah that's the that's stuff that, that I don't... Am I, ooh, am I supposed to say... Yeah, you can curse. Okay, but that's so interesting. We curse a lot on my show, so I'm... I saw a quote from Philip Roth one time who said that uh, if he's struggling to get to the next sentence or struggling to figure out where to go, that means that he's doing well. And if he can just sort of write without thinking about it, that means that he's usually just rewriting the same thing over and over again with new with right. new sentences. And what's what's great about this show is that we we um, interview a, a whole host of different genre writers, right? So we we interview um, comedians. You know, what does it mean to like write a joke? How do you how do you write a stand up set? Like what 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 is the process involved in that? We interview you know, Pulitzer Prize winning novelists for whom writing is a much different experience, much more sort of something that they do by themselves, alone, in a room. No one gets to see it until the whole thing is done. Um, is that what Nguyen, who you... Who you yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he does? I mean, he has readers, I'm sure, that he brings it to prior to... Uh, no, so we were talking about Vietan uh, Wen, who's um, the Pulitzer Prize winning Sorry, author... Sorry, how do you say his last name? Wen. Wen. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Sympathizer. And like most novelists, um, I'm, I'm the same way. <clears throat> I'll, sell a, I'll sell a work, and then no one else will ever see that work again until it's done. I don't turn in chapters. I don't turn in anything because I just, it's too, 
you know, the whole thing is so unwieldy, and I just want to make sure that it's all mine until it's ready to be seen. Do you have readers or anything? No. Nope. You... No, no. Really? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. It might be a bad idea. I know that there are a lot of writers who want constant feedback. Well, yeah. how, what does this look like? What do you think? I am the it's opposite. Clear, I don't want like... anyone. I don't want anyone to see it. I don't want anyone to tell me what they think about it until I am completely done with it. But then you look at the, you know, the guys, the the Marvel guys, um, Chris, Chris, and um, Steve. And talk about a collaborative process. I mean, all, all TV writing, all film writing is collaborative anyway because you have to constantly be dealing with, you know, all the other people who are involved in turning, you know, a $200 million project into something that's, that's finished. So no screenwriter is allowed to actually do what a novelist would do, which is like, it's mine until it's finished. But in their case you know, they're part of like this gigantic global machine, right? They're not just writing a movie, they're writing the 20th movie in a series. And so they're in constant, every scene has to be uh, discussed with other people before it can, it can go on. So there's a whole host of different ways of doing it. Another one of the great interviews that we did this season was with Vic Mensa, the great rapper and, and activist. And and for him, you know, the writing experience is oftentimes just put on a beat and then put on some headphones and then just go and see what comes out. Um, and then the difference between that and having to sit down with and his new album with bandmates and actually write lyrics, which he, he's never done before, you know, like write a lyric and practice it. So songwriters, journalists, novelists, screenwriters, um, we run the gambit. Why is writing, and I think specifically for writers, I mean, it's the more you write, the more fascinating other people's processes become, yeah. right? The more engaged or not even interested, but obsessed it becomes like, well, how do you do it? Because I just don't know if the way that I do it is the right way, but it's the way yeah. that I do it. But maybe you do it the right way and I can do it your way, you know? This is actually how I knew that this show was going to work because, you know, as a writer myself and as somebody who has a lot of friends who are writers, um, writers love to talk about writing. You know, like I was saying before, any excuse not to write will take. So if it's like I could be writing or I could be talking about writing, I'm going to talk about writing. And instead. it's like it's also yeah. it's not enough that we have a job that we can share our thoughts on paper. We need <laughs> right. to talk about we it talk with anybody that yeah, wants to listen. It. And uh, you know, we when we first kind of envisioned this this show, this used to be this live show that we would do in L.A. once a month. You know, we would just be in a, in a nightclub and we'd sell tickets and we'd pick a writer and then people would come and. And what, what we sort of always envisioned was, you know, I was a big fan of that show um, Inside the Actor's Studio, that old show that I think a lot of people have seen. Um, and I always thought, what if we did Inside the Actor's Studio, but with writers, but in a nightclub with live music and everybody's drunk? Mm. That, that could actually work. And it's been fantastic because, you know, yes, writers love to talk about writing, but, you know, we, we don't write things so that no one sees them, like we want to be part of the cultural conversation. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot to say about politics and society and race and you know conflict and all these things. So every one of these writers that we have on here, um, you know, the conversations very quickly became a, not just about writing, but about what writing has to say about what's going on in the world. You know, we had um, uh, Latinx writers um, who are working on very successful television shows, but who are dealing with these real life issues about immigration and about, you know, refugees. Uh, uh, we have writers talking about race uh, and about culture and politics, you know, Th this this old adage about the pen being mightier than the sword, which you know we all sort of know and we kind of laugh about. Um, there's something very true about that. I mean, art uh, of every kind, but particularly writing, has always had uh, a profound effect on society and the way that we see the world. Storytelling, storytelling, in, is how we understand the world around us. It's been that way since we were wearing loincloths and living in caves, and it's still that way today. It's just that the, the platform through which we tell stories has changed. Did you find that any writers were hesitant to talk about the other the other issues that you may have been interested in, or was it more of an organic process where it was clear that those things were on your mind and then bring it out of them a little bit? Yet yeah, this is the genius of our format, because three drinks in, Right. And yeah, all of a sudden you're like, yeah, let's talk about race. Let's let's do that. Um, 
That's where I stopped talking about right now. I'm <laughs> yeah. No, it's the perfect time. It's like, I want to talk politics. I'm drunk enough now. Um, I, I think there there sometimes is a little bit of hesitation. I think sometimes, particularly with the with the real successful writers, um, they there's this sort of notion that, well, maybe I should just sort of keep that stuff to myself. But um, not only do I encourage those kinds of conversations uh, and the libations, as I say, helps kind of loosen the tongues a little bit and makes people a little bit more willing to to be honest about how they feel about what's going on in the world. But I also feel like it's an obligation. It really is an obligation. I mean, writers, by definition, are people with very loud voices. You know, they're, um, they, they are in a position in which their thoughts, their ideas, the way that they see the world and their role in the world, um, it can be shared uh, in the in some cases, in the case of you know the Marvel guys, by tens of millions of people around the world. And so, especially in this day and age where we are now, um, if you have a voice of that magnitude and you are not willing to use it to, at the very least. Um, help people make sense of what's happening in, in the world right now, then I think that it's a real failure uh, on, on your part. That it's, it's a responsibility that we have. And to not do something with that responsibility, I think, is, is frankly shameful. Even if your work, in, and I agree with you, but even if your work in no way necessitates or, or alludes to having any kind of opinion about that, like I would say the Marvel guys, for, for the most part, it is a very they, apolitical movie. And, and you think? Some, I, I mean, I think so. maybe it's just not political enough for, for for me, but I find it fairly apolitical. Well, look, I mean, the the last two Marvel movies and Endgame, which is you know now the the the, the most successful uh, film in in history, um, is a movie uh, about uh, this kind of evil dictatorial man who is dealing with a very real existential crisis, which is the fact that the world has become unsustainable. Um, and so here, they very cleverly took the antagonist and they gave him uh, you know, a motivation that we all share in a very existential way, right? And so just the very notion of forcing an audience to deal in, in a, you know, yeah, in the, in the guise of mythology and comic books and all of that stuff, but to deal with a very real issue which is the existential crisis of climate change that we are all dealing with? That we, you know, we may not be around uh, in 2030, um, and then to turn it into this kind of, you know, comic book extravaganza, you know, spectacle, uh, I think uh, is very subversive. In in other ways, by the way, just talking about the fact that comic book. Uh, movies and superhero movies certainly have become our dominant new mythology. Yeah. They become it's more than the dominant culture. It's our new mythology. Myth, you know, myths have always been how human beings have understood the world, right? Myths are all about why. They, they answer the question why. Why is the world the way it is? We always have a story for it. And certainly we're in a place now where um, these superheroes have kind of replaced God for us, right? I mean, I asked this question of the of um, Steve uh, Steve uh, himself in, in the in the episode where I say something like, you know, who would you rather have the justice of the God's justice or Captain America's justice? And most people I think would say Captain America's justice. And that's not just a fun comic book uh, question. It really says a lot about where we are uh, in the world right now, where we feel like religion has failed us. Politics has failed us. The people who were supposed to take care of us have failed us. And now we are longing for a new mythology, a new savior. And here comes Captain America. Here comes Iron Man. There's a reason why these movies are You're not just me movies. Right now. I mean, if you think, if you think, honestly, if you think like that these Marvel movies are just movies, you're not watching them carefully enough. They are redefining uh, our very mythology. Um, they're giving us a new set of myths and metaphors 
to deal with the realities of the of the changing world that we're in. We're all a little bit unmoored right now. We're all a little bit lost. Can I ask you, do you think that that is Marvel itself as creators doing that? Or do you think that is the state of the world doing that? Chicken or the egg here, right? You know, does, do, does culture shape politics or does politics shape culture? Writers shape culture. It's Stan Lee. It's the the comic book history. I mean, it's not a coincidence that comic books and superheroes were created in the run up to the Second World War, right? right? Uh, the first time we see Captain America, what's he doing? He's punching Hitler in the face. You know, uh, the bad guys have changed, but the superheroes are still the same. They are still how we see them now as sort of the new gods, right? The gods, the old gods have failed us. And the new gods are the ones that we are now looking towards. So these aren't just movies. They're almost a new kind of scripture. And I think when you start thinking about it in those terms, it's no longer just, oh, it's in the zeitgeist, right? Oh, it's just sort of the moment that superheroes are having. And suddenly you realize. It's like 20 years of a moment. Yeah, it's a very long moment. Exactly. And you recognize that, you know, the reason that these are so successful is because they've tapped into something that we are all longing for. Oh, that's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, I know you. I know how you're a huge superheroes uh, film fan, but uh, I get that. I don't mind them. <laughs> I don't mind them. Uh, I, I think our cultural obsession with them is 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 dangerous and 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 upsets me at time, and I think it further infantilizes the nation. Uh, but that's just me. Well, and let me tell you. So I I don't necessarily disagree with that, but there's a reason why. Um, this, you know, uh, our show interviewed the writers of Endgame and not the writers of Justice League. No, you know, I don't, I, again, no of offense. Of course. No offense. But the difference between those two movies isn't that one had more spectacle than the other. Spectacle is not the point. The difference is that one of them was written better than the other. Right. And the reason that movie is so successful isn't because of the fireworks. There are a lot of movies with fireworks. Right. Um, the reason it's successful is because two people sat down and wrote it in such a way as to manipulate our emotions. And that's what we want to get to. Whether it's a, a novel or whether it's a superhero movie, it's still about writing. Writers manipulating words. I mean, using words to manipulate emotions. I mean, that's that's a... It's a magical uh, thing that happens. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions for audience. Who's a question? Hey. Hi there. Um, as a writer, I sometimes uh, struggle with knowing when a work is finished. I'll sometimes rewrite things until it becomes no longer recognizable from the original idea. So I was wondering what advice you had to when, to knowing when something is finished. Uh, first of all, I hear you. I'm in the exact same place. Uh, that's why uh, it's always nice to have a contract, a contract that says. This is due in two weeks. So no matter where you are, it's time to turn it in. That always helps. Not everybody gets that, but what I often have told people is set your own deadlines. Create your own calendar and your own deadlines because, yes, you can edit a thing into oblivion, um, and you have to be very, very careful of that. But I will say that on the flip side, not a lot of writers understand the editing process. You know, a, a great writer once, uh, Annie Dillard, um, I'm paraphrasing her, but she basically said, writing is rewriting. That's what writing is. Writing is rewriting. Um, yes, there's a point in which rewriting has to stop, but never forget that that first sentence, the first time you wrote that sentence is is just sort of the first splash of paint that you put on the canvas. It takes 10, 12 more layers of paint before something truly artistic becomes recognizable. Do you find you, uh, and I find this differs with lots of writers, your process of rewriting is taking away or adding? That's a very, very good question. I think for me it goes up, so I, I add until I realize it's gone too far, right. and then it's about, okay, what can I remove from this? Um, an one of, another sort of great uh, metaphor that I use is, is like sculpting, right? You know, you have a, you have a block of, of wood or a block of stone. Um, the first tool that you use is just kind of a big hammer and a big uh, you know, chisel, and you just take out giant blocks. 
and then you use a smaller tool and you make it a little bit more formed. Then you use a smaller tool and then now suddenly you can see the face. Then you use a smaller tool and you get all the, the sort of details and you're still not done because now you have to polish it and now you have to clean it. Um, the same thing is true about writing. Uh, get that first sentence out and then take out the smaller tools. Is that the right adverb? Is that, do you even need an adverb? Is this the right way to, to put the sentence? Keep working at it, keep working at it, and then polish it and polish it until it's finally done. Stephen King would say no adverbs. He would say do not use an adverb, I believe. And Stephen King is famously somebody who doesn't rewrite. Stephen King no, is- Is that true? I thought yeah, that- somebody, you should talk to Stephen King's editors. He's very, he very famous. The reason that Stephen King novel is like 3,000 pages is precisely because he just sits down and writes. Right. Now, there aren't very many people who can do that, and he does have a very good editor. He, he rewrites. <laughs> I, 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 in his book on writing, he talks about his process of uh, writing the first draft, the door is closed, rewriting, the door is open. Oh, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, exactly. And I think... I think for ev for every person, there's a different way of of you know conceiving about how how that process works, whether it's a a vomited first draft or not, or whether you're constantly rewriting as you write. But again, yeah, writing is rewriting. That's a, that's a very good sort of rule of thumb to keep in mind. The hardest thing about writing, I find, and and conversations with people about writing and listening to processes is that if you don't have your own process and if you listen to how other people do it, it can really get in the way. Like when someone says, your first draft should just be a vomit draft, and then you sit down and you're like, why aren't I vomiting? Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm exactly. still working really <laughs> hard to pull this first draft out of me. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, no, you got you to gotta find your, you, you definitely have to find your own process, but that's just a, a matter of practicing, you know? Um, um, you know, if you want to become an NBA uh, player, uh, you need to go out there and shoot a hundred free throws a day. Like that's just what it—that's what it takes. Um, and it's so funny that people don't realize that any artistic endeavor is the same process. If you want to be a writer, you know, you got to get out there. You just write those sentences. Keep practicing. Read other people's sentences. Copy the way that other people do. I mean, we all copy each other. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, figure out authors that you really gravitate towards, figure out how they do what they do, and steal it. Yep. Just, you know, we're, we're all, that's, it's all about stealing and making it your own. Um, but that, that's what it takes to make your own process. Tracy Letts has this video on YouTube that is like how to live a creative life, and it's just like 10 rules to living a creative life, and one of them is steal. And he steal. just says, he says, look, every idea has been done, so just steal. Just steal it. Eventually, when you filter it, if you have any talent at all, it'll become your own, right? Like, yeah, yeah. That's kind of... And this also comes, this sort of, this conversation that happens a lot in writing about craft and art, right? There's a reason we call it the craft of writing. We don't, we don't call it the art of writing because a craft is something that actually can be learned. You can figure out... Yep. Um, you know, it, you can go to art school and, f and learn uh, brush technique. You can learn how to mix paints. You can learn how to do proper perspective. Those are craft things that someone can teach you. But in the end, the talent is sort of innate. What makes a brilliant artist uh, different than, you know, uh, just kind of a, a an average artist. Which it's okay um, to be. Which is totally fine to be, yeah. yeah. So, same thing, you know, what's the difference between a brilliant writer and a writer who's just kind of okay? Um, I don't know. That's where, the, that's where the magic and mystery lies. And I think a lot of that has to do with who you are as an individual. Reading, I think, is a big part of it. Like, if, if, if shooting free throws is how you become a good basketball player, reading is how you become a good writer. Yeah. Right? That's the equivalent of us shooting free throws. If you want to be a writer, you should never not be reading. Like, you, you should, should always have a book. Never not be reading. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more question. Hi. Um, I was just wondering who some of your favorite writers are. Uh, my favorite writers tend to be uh, foreigners. Uh, so uh, my all-time all -time favorite writer is Fyodor Dostoevsky, a great Russian novelist um, who just sort of just blew my mind, just scrambled my brain when I was in high school. I, you know, I, I read one of his books almost on a dare, really. Crime and Punishment, your uh, first No, one? no, I read um, The Brothers Karamazov. Oh, um, wow. 
And your first, your first. Day yeah, day? I was, I was like 16, and I thought that I was so cool, and I was like, "What's the biggest book that I could read?" And I was like, "I can't even pronounce this guy's name, and it's like a thousand pages. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be that guy. I'm gonna read so cool. this book. I know exactly. <laughs> yeah, it tells you, it tells you a little bit about, <laughs> about my your, circles. Yeah, yeah exactly. that was my, that was my way of being cool. Whoa, uh, did you see how big this? Book check out how big this Russian novel is, man. Um, and then I read it, and I was like, "What is happening? What is? I've never, I've never felt emotions like this. Um, I've never had anyone you give me the proper words to for me to even express how I felt about things in my life." I was like, "Is this what it, a writer does? This is what I want to do." Um, I also am I'm a big fan of Latin writers. Antonio Loba and Tunis, the great Portuguese writer, is one of my uh, heroes, um, Pablo Naruda, um, the, those, those are the guys that really, because I think for me, because I, I love myth and I love sort of that, that kind of storytelling, I'm not nearly as interested in kind of real, realist fiction, mm. you know, I love things that bend genres and, and make you look at the world in a completely different way, so that tends to be something that you see a lot more in in Latin writers, in, in um, you know, r f foreign writers, even British writers tend to do that a lot more than American writers do. M American writing is is very much steeped in the kind of, you know, Steinbeck, Hemingway, Carver model of um, this is a novel about a man who wakes up and goes get it, gets a donut and but comes home. You should home. talk my Steinbeck. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I, you know, I love Steinbeck, but that's. That's kind of the trajectory of American writing. Uh, it's what's taught in all the writing schools, sure. you know? Yeah. Um, and I appreciate that kind of writing, but it's not, it doesn't stir my soul. Whereas you get to, when you talk about Gar uh, Garcia Marquez yeah. or something, it's called magical realism, and it's taught as magical realism. And it's sort of very much categorized as something, I mean, it is different, but it feels a little bit the way that it's taught. Like, this is the real stuff, the natural, the social realism, the naturalism, and this is this is the other work. Exactly, and maybe it's just because I see the world differently that I yeah. do see. To me, magical realism is the world. The world is magical. There, that the the sort of the longing of the human soul for connection. You know, the the drive for transcendence. The way that we all are just like longing for an experience that can't just be defined by this material world, uh, to me, that's what ri that's where writing should be. So writing should be about that longing, that existence that's just beyond, you know? So, yeah, I get it that we just kind of sometimes dismiss it as magical realism or we put it in a box we and we call it magical realism. Yeah. Exactly. But I think, like, that's that's the world that I want to live in. That's that's how I experience the world. It's so interesting because I'm a 100% like American traditionalist. <laughs> like, yeah. give me Steinbeck yeah. and some, Philip Roth. Give me some, yeah, Philip Roth, some Hemingway, and I'm good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, Reza, how can people see Rough Draft? Uh, it is going to be on Topics News streaming service uh, topic which uh, has been around for many many years uh, they've been great doing uh, incredible films like Spotlight and uh, incredible TV shows and, and documentary series like Losers on Netflix which is one of my absolute favorite uh, documentary series you gotta see it um, is now doing what I think every studio and I don't, I'm not talking about the Disney size studios. I'm talking about those sort of mid-level studios need to start doing, which is creating its own streaming service, uh, bringing all of their their uh, volume and their library directly to the consumer. Um, you know, it's like five bucks a month, and you can have access to all of this material and all this sort of acquired material that they're getting. Some amazing shows from Italy and from uh, Korea, um, and they're bringing it to a kind of audience. You know, it's funny because I, you know, I, I work in Hollywood and I and I deal with, you know, the, the sort of the changes in the way that we're consuming media and and everybody is constantly talking about the streaming wars between Apple and Disney and yeah, those are the behemoths and I get it. You know, that's like going to Walmart, you know, or going to Costco if you want something. But sometimes the kind of entertainment you want needs to be a little bit more bespoke. And I think that's what's happening now. And it's it's really exciting to see uh, someone like Topic riding that wave, you know, recognizing what's about to come, that we're all going to be consuming entertainment through streamers 
And so to get in on that early, but in a small and very curated way, you know, we have we have a particular audience. Like, who, what kind of audience wants to see two writers sitting in a bar drinking whiskey and talking about, you know, that's 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 who we're going for. Like, you, you know, the guy that's who, who we want. sits in a bar with writers and drinks whiskey and, and drinks whiskey. And talks whiskey. About exactly. Process. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's that's it. Uh, Reza, thank you so much for being here, man. Congratulations on the show. It's on Topics Streaming Network. It's called Rough Draft. Everybody, everybody give me a huge round of applause for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.